thank you for this way. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, today I will try to shed some light on the state of the world's finance system and its intellectual and academic foundations. The background to this includes the current global financial crisis and the fact that in most advanced economies, the financial sector has grown at a much faster pace than the rest of the economy for decades and uses up enormous resources. Although a well-functioning financial industry is certainly a necessity for a modern economy, it is not clear why it has to consume an ever-growing proportion of our resources. The current financial crisis has clearly shown the substantial downsides to having very large financial systems. Not only are they costly to operate, but they also generate a lot of risk for the rest of the economy. The work that I will be presenting today is based to a large extent on my collaboration with two colleagues, Shyam Sunder of Yale University in the US and Vivek Chowdhury of Monash University in Australia. We have now been working on this project for a couple of years, aiming for writing a book on the topic. The questions the three of us ask include, how much finance and what kind of finance the world needs? Is there such a thing as too much, too little, or dysfunctional aspects of finance that reduce instead of enhancing prosperity? What do we know about answers to these questions? What do we not know? What can we know and cannot know? I will certainly not address all of them today, but hope to shed some light on some of them. At first glance, it is puzzling that with the vast research on finance in both the academic and practitioner community, such fundamental issues are not at the forefront of thought and discussion. Perhaps the fault lies not within finance, but a failure of those outside to point out the emperor has no clothes. Prejudice of thought is a reality of the human condition. If we wish to gain a better understanding of the power and limitations of the world we live in, we sometimes need a different perspective from the conventional wisdom. The global financial crisis served, but ever so briefly, as a wake-up call for research, practitioner, and policy communities to rethink the basic assumptions that underlie the workings and societal value of modern finance. While much has been written, little has changed to reduce the chance of future crisis. Six years on, after massive and continuing losses to economies and public exchequers around the world, happy days are here again in the world of finance. The fundamentals are unchanged. Staggering amounts of public funds have been used to put out fires, but with few meaningful strings attached. So the financial institutions that have benefited can for the most part continue to operate in much the same way as they did in the period leading up to the crisis. Now, a modern economy is unthinkable without financial markets, institutions, and products. This calls for cons spending considerable resources on the financial sector. This was established early on, for example, by Schumpeter in 1911 and confirmed in many later studies, including those of Goldsmith in 1969 and King and Levine in 1993. It seems unequivocally true that there is a link between the establishment and initial expansion of finance and an associated change in the macroeconomic growth of an economy. This can be traced back all the way to a barter economy and periodic innovations and expansions that enabled more economic activity to take place. A classic example of this is the Limited Liability Corporation, an innovation that allowed the establishment of various enterprises and the corresponding economic activity that would have been next to impossible otherwise. The financial sector, however, always plays a supporting role in the economy. 
We cannot consume financial products, but they are often necessary for economic activity in other sectors that do produce goods and services that people then consume. So growth of the financial sector is hardly a reasonable goal in itself for society. Such growth is only useful um, for the economy as a whole to the degree that it increases output in other sectors. In the end, it is Main Street that matters, not Wall Street. Like the idea of a well-functioning judiciary, schools, and many other institutions, the link between a well-resourced and functioning finance sector and macroeconomic growth is unobjectionable. The problem, as with the judiciary and education, is that we cannot simply conclude that more is always better than less. Indeed, one may expect that as the sector expands, complexity, attraction of talent, obfuscation of value creation, etc., all lead to an increasing cost of delivery of financial services. The debate on how much finance is optimal is thus still very much open. It is nevertheless in interesting that early indications are that the optimal size of banking systems may not be much greater than one year's GDP or gross domestic product. This would mean that the US banking system is at present approximately optimal in size, but that most European banking systems are far too big. The current crisis has also clearly shown that a very large financial system may not only be very costly to operate, it can also cons create considerable risk for the rest of the economy. Financial crises have very real effects. They lead to a contraction of output for an extended period, which is accompanied by race, rising unemployment and social tension. In addition, boom and bust cycles in financial markets can have very substantial redistributive effects. Financial booms can create enormous wealth on paper, with a subsequent financial crisis destroying it again, leaving many individuals much worse off than before the party started. A striking example of this includes millions of households in various countries that bought real estate near the height of a boom in its price and have since suffered losses that can easily be the equivalent of several years' income. At the same time, others end up with much greater wealth than before the boom-burst cycle started if they had the good fortune to sell their speculative holdings before asset prices declined too much. This is much like a Ponzi or pyramid scheme. Those that exit early can make a killing. Those that do not lose their shirt. Now, financial systems grew more rapidly than the economy as a whole in most developed countries in the decades leading up to the current financial crisis. This seems to hold irrespective of which measure of size is used. As one example, in 13 of the current Eurozone members, uh, member countries, the banking sector's combined balance sheet was about one and a half times GDP in 1980, but has grown steadily ever since and was 3.2 times GDP in 2009, twice as large in relative terms. In a recent paper by Philippon and Reshev, they find that there was a change in the relationship between what they term financial output and income around 1980, with the ratio between the change in the former and the change in the latter much higher after 1980 than in the previous 30 years that they look at. Now that could indicate that the tremendous growth of the financial sector since 1980 has not resulted in much growth of the rest of the economy. Now, of course, the size of the banking system can be measured in many ways. The combined balance sheet of banks is one common measure, but certainly not the only one. Indeed, not necessarily the most useful one. Another measure is the proportion of the workforce employed in banking or finance in general. The trend here has been clearly upwards in most, if not all, developed countries. This has happened even if Few industries have had the same opportunity as the financial industry 
to increase productivity in recent decades. In earlier times, the industry needed an army of people to work with all sorts of paper instruments, checks, etc., and paper-based systems of recording, communication, accounting, and control. With electronic payment and data systems, this is no longer the case. Even the use of paper money and coins has shrunk. Internet banking and ATMs have drastically and dramatically reduced the need for staff and extensive branch networks. In light of this, one would have expected the number of workers in the financial system, banking in particular, to shrink. But the opposite has happened. Automation has replaced many jobs, but the financial sector has expanded so fast that the total labor force in the sector has grown. Wages in the financial sector have also risen considerably faster than in other sectors. Cross-sectional comparisons suggest that managers and specialists in the financial sector are paid considerably better than their counterparts in other industries with similar skills. In the United States, this wage premium has been estimated to have grown from zero in the early 1970s to about 70% currently. This high compensation is not only costly to the financial sector and its customers, it has also starved other sectors of new talent. In the year 2008, 28% of Harvard College graduates went to work in the financial sector, compared to approximately 6% 40 years later. This phenomenon extends to graduates of some extant fields, such as engineering and science. It would take some research to find out the welfare consequences of this near monopolization of society's best and brightest by a single industry. Another useful measure of size is the amount of domestic credit provided by the banking system. It is one of the most important roles of any banking system. In all of the world's major economies, credit provided by the banking system to the domestic economy has at least doubled in the last half century as a percentage of GDP. And it has in many cases grown far more than that. This dramatic increase in domestic credit at a far quicker pace than economic activity raises several questions. Does this mean that advanced economies have become relatively more dependent on capital in the last decades? The answer to that is both yes and no. Clearly, they depend on far more financial capital. They do not, however, rely on a larger capital stock that is real assets, at least not as such assets are normally measured. The ratio between the capital stock and GDP varies over time and across countries, but has in most advanced e economies been between two and four since at least the middle of the last century and shown no signs of an upward trend. The average ratio for 22 OECD countries was thus 314% in 1960 and 300% uh, 40 years later. So this increase in domestic credit is not financing a larger stock of physical capital. Other possible uses of all this increased credit include consumption, both private and public. Statistics clearly show that the public sector and household debt have been rising in most advanced economy. Indeed, that is a crucial factor in the current financial crisis with household debt having grown rapidly in the years leading up to the crisis. When economies contracted, wages fell and unemployment rose, overextended households found themselves in dire straits. This resulted in a need for substantial write-offs in many countries. Although the focus has often been on mortgage debt, other types of household debt have also grown, with households borrowing to finance their consumption. Similarly, the sovereign debt part of the crisis is at least in part due to the public sector in advanced economies borrowing heavily to bridge a gap between expenditures and revenues in the years leading up to the crisis. 
In the period 1993 to 2011, the member countries of the OECD as a whole only once balanced their budget in the year 2000. Over the whole period, the average budget deficit was 3.5% of GDP, leading to ever-increasing debt levels by the public sector. The Eurozone and the United States fared similarly by this measure. This unsustainable path of public finances meant that when the Minsky moment came in, current, in the current crisis, that is, creditors got cold feet and started rushing for the exits, it was not only financial institutions that found themselves unable to roll over their massive liabilities. The public sector in many countries faced the same dilemma. Thus, we had the worst possible scenario with both the public sector and the private sector trying to deleverage at the same time. This could only and did lead to massive contraction of economic activity in most developed countries. Now, if we look at the world economy as a whole, investment must equal savings. But investment does not seem to be rising faster than GDP. So in the world as a whole, savings must be rising at a similar pace. This implies that the growth of the financial sector and the various balance sheets related to that sector corresponds to increasing shifting of consumption, private and public, over time. Borrowers bring consumption forward in time, and lenders postpone consumption. The growth may, however, not be as great as the raw figures indicate, the reason being a tendency for double counting in the statistics. More complicated financial structures can lead to what are intrinsically the same claims appearing as assets or liabilities on many balance sheets. The current financial crisis has led some researchers to look at the number of links, so to speak, in the chain within the financial system that connects borrowers and savers. The simplest type of loan is a direct loan from one entity, the saver, to another in need for capital. The simplest type of a loan made by a financial system has only one intermediary, a bank that collects deposits and makes loans. But modern financial systems have a growing tendency to generate chains with ever more links and increasingly going back and forth across national borders. So although national banking systems have grown at a very rapid pace for a long time, this growth is dwarfed by that of cross-border liabilities within the international finance systems. Their average nominal growth has been a little under 18% per year since the late 1970s. In dollar terms, these cross-border liabilities have thus grown by a factor of 40 in less than a quarter of a century. This is staggering growth by any measure. It now stands at slightly more than US dollars 30 trillion after having peaked at 35 trillion US dollars in 2008. This is approximately equal to the combined annual GDP of the USA and the whole European Union. One effect of these huge liabilities is that trouble in the financial sector in individual countries has unavoidable domino effects across borders. Recent events in the Mediterranean are but the latest example of this with losses by Cypriot banks due to their holdings of toxic Greek debt, leading to large losses by, amongst others, Russian investors. This is also one of the reasons that the international financial system now appears shakier than ever. Hot money is in a continuous quest for return or shelter, jumping from one country to another with lightning speed. Herd behavior is a source of endless problems, and local problems quickly call for international rescue effort, efforts. Now, turnover in financial markets for currencies, bonds, stocks, etc., has grown even faster than the combined value of the stock of these assets. Furthermore, new markets have appeared for various assets that did not exist or had little trading volume and have grown rapidly to become very large. <clears throat> 
This is especially true of various forms of derivatives. Assess assessing the pros and cons of having a large turnover in financial markets is something of a challenge. To a degree, increased turnover is a positive development. It increases the liquidity of assets, which is usually a benefit. To the extent trading is based on independent assessment of the value of the asset by the counterparties to the trade, every trade brings the private information and beliefs of the participants to be aggregated and incorporated into prices and allocation outcomes of the markets in a Hayekian perspective. There are, however, also clear indications that too much turnover can lead to instability of prices, which is a drawback. In addition, increased turnover usually goes in hand in hand with increased cost, a benefit for those that receive turnover related fees, but not for those paying them. It is fairly obvious that the turnover in many financial markets is much greater than what is called for by the needs of the real economy. So we want stable markets that price assets well and are sufficiently deep to allow for the trades that are needed, but we do not want markets that generate fluctuations unrelated to the fundamentals, increasing both the direct cost of transactions as well as the indirect costs of worse allocated decisions induced by more volatile prices. Now, one staple of intro-economics courses is that un unimpeded flow of financial capital across societies will always promote growth and welfare. This is still the position of many influential bodies, such as the World Economic Forum. Arguments for this proposition are well known and based on the idea that when left to themselves, resources will flow to uses where they are most productive financial capital being no exception. In essence, this would be the invisible hand often attributed to Adam Smith at work. This thought greatly affected the discussion from the 1970s until the 1990s on European monetary issues that led to the eventual adoption of a common European currency and the freedom of movement of capital within the EU. Mundell's 1973 paper was one of the cornerstones of this school of thought. The scenarios that people envisioned were that shocks would originate in the real economy, uh, like crop failures, but the financial sector would take actions that dampened the effects. What was not foreseen was that macroeconomic shocks might have their origin in the financial system with the reaction of the markets being exactly the opposite of what had been expected, namely depressed areas having to fight capital flight, exacerbating their initial problems. The global trend pre-crisis was increasing flows and removal of barriers to flows. The crisis has, however, not only seen introduction of capital controls in some advanced economies, but also rekindled interest in measures that would curb the flow of capital across borders, such as the Tobin tax. Those that believe that unimpeded flow of capital across borders may not always be beneficial for the economy, often dwell on the turbulence created by rapid fluctuations in short-term capital flows. Joseph Stiglitz and others have argued in favor of capital controls on the grounds that rapid injection and withdrawal of foreign capital will put local markets into large amplitude fluctuations, which damages instead of helping their real economies. There are other well-known complications to this story. One is that many countries with oversized financial sectors rely on banking secrecy and a favorable tax environment for their comparative advantage, rather than, say, greater productivity due to economies of scale or scope, or well-developed institutions or sector-specific human capital. Vast resources are used to shelter revenues from tax authorities. This can explain the introduction of some financial products and oversized financial sectors in jurisdictions that are seen as especially inviting for this kind of activity. <clears throat> 
This may mean that the global distribution of the production of financial services is far from optimal in the Pareto sense. Resources used on tax avoidance or evasion are part of the deadweight loss of taxation. Proponents of free capital flows early on often argue that such freedom and freely floating nominal exchange rates would generally lead to stable real exchange rate. That, in turn, would help stabilize economies. The idea was that with market forces adjusting nominal exchange rates to reflect macroeconomic fundamentals, real exchange rates would be relatively stable. This was the case that Milton Friedman and many others brought against the Bretton Woods system since its beginning in the 1940s. A mountain of empirical evidence, however, suggests that nominal exchange rates can be extremely volatile under a freely floating system and with free capital flows. This has led to real exchange rates also fluctuating wildly when investors chase short-term gains from exchange rate movements, interest rate differentials, or try to gain in other ways from various perceived or real capital market imperfections. The instability of exchange rates, be they real or nominal, has been one of the chronic challenges of international financial markets since the breakup of the Bretton Woods systems, system in the late 60s. It is one aspect of a larger problem, namely that asset prices in general fluctuate considerably more than economic fundamentals would suggest is reasonable, as Robert Schiller showed with his pioneering work on stock market volatility in the 1980s. Despite this, there are no obviously better alternatives. Various attempts at pegging currencies to one another after the demise of Bretton Woods have a fairly mixed track record. European Union countries tried various so-called exchange rate mechanisms before the euro. They were plagued by frequent crises. The euro was supposed to end all that, and did at least up to a point, but has of course had numerous problems of its own. Ever since the market crash and the Great Depression of the decade following 1929, and, un and until quite recently, there seems to have been a widespread belief that financial crises happen in economies, economies with underdeveloped financial and even real sectors. So we had Latin American, Russian, and Asian crises. It was widely accepted that the expansion of financial markets makes the economy less susceptible to crises, financial or otherwise. Since the current crisis has, however, predominantly hit countries with disproportionately large financial markets, it now seems clear that the expansion of financial markets does not make countries immune to financial crises, probably quite the opposite. The crisis appears to have hit harder in some economies where the financial sector had grown beyond the demands of their domestic economies. What seems to be most dangerous is to have a financial sector that has grown very rapidly, has become quite large relative to the underlying economy, in countries that do not have long-standing traditions of banking and do not have reliable access to a powerful lender of last resort. In this respect, think Iceland, Ireland, or Cyprus. But the current crisis, which has mainly struck the US and Europe, does not bear a ge geographic moniker. It has been labeled as a global crisis in spite of the fact that large parts of the world economy for example, China, India, Russia, and Brazil, were, at least until recently, barely touched by it. The crisis has mainly struck countries with high income levels and large financial sectors that were, until the onset of the crisis, in many cases, considered state-of-the-art and the envy of the rest of the world. This seriously undermines the received wisdom on the linkage between financial development and proneness to crises. Of course, Reinhard and Rokoff in their 2009 book documented quite clearly that financial crises are not black swans. They may be tail events, but they are still fairly common. It just so happened that none struck developed countries during the golden era of the first 30 years or so following World War II. 
This may have led many to the erroneous conclusion that the most affluent countries in the world had reached a state of development that made them immune to substantial financial crises, or at least that they would recover relatively quickly, like the US did after the crises of the 1980s, and the Nordic countries uh, more or less did after their crisis in the early 1990s. The adoption of measures such as a Tobin tax or capital controls is hard to justify for those that believe strongly in the efficiency of financial markets. The crisis has, however, led some to argue that, much like oil tankers benefit greatly from compartmentalization, the world economy would be more stable with some compartmentalization, in particular restrictions on short-term flows of capital across borders. Many countries that have relied on massive inflows of capital in the past and accumulated substantial foreign liabilities have during the current crises seen the inflow come to a screeching halt or even turn into an outflow. When that happens, something has got to give. Introducing capital controls is one possible measure, default another. Assistance from larger entities with deeper pockets like the IMF or the EU, yet another. Heavily indebted governments that primarily borrow in their own currency, such as Japan, the US or the UK, enjoy the implicit backing of their own central bank. Even if the central banks are nominally independent, it is clear that before one of these governments would literally run out of local currency and default, its central bank would step up and provide financing, if not directly, then indirectly. With the ability to literally print money, the credit rating of these countries and access to financial markets is excellent, despite enormous fiscal deficits, ballooning public debt, and in the case of the USA and UK, chronic current account deficits. That is a huge advantage compared to countries that borrow primarily in foreign currency. To see this, one can, for example, compare the interest that the Japanese government has to pay compared to the Spanish government. The Japanese government has much larger debt relative to GDP and a much larger fiscal deficit, but the yield on its 10-year bonds in yen is now about 0.7% per year, while on comparable bonds issued by the Spanish government in euros, it is 4.5% at present. If the Japanese government had to pay an interest rate comparable to the Spanish government, this would increase its annual bill for such payments by approximately 8% of GDP, which would with little doubt be considered completely unsustainable. Now, individual countries do not have the right to print euros. Instead, the ECB has this right. Thus, all the Eurozone governments borrow in foreign currency in a sense. Uh, a very costly arrangement for various Mediterranean finance ministries, as we now know. That is one of the fundamental weaknesses of the common currency. The ECB, however, has a clear mandate to act as a lender of last resort to solvent but illiquid banks or financial system, and this it has done. The support of the ECB for sovereign bonds has, however, not been unconditional, and there has been a fierce political debate within the bank and between the various EU countries on what role the ECB should play when it comes to financing Eurozone governments. That said, in the end, it did provide massive financing for many Eurozone governments. As a result, the balance sheet of the ECB has ballooned from about 1.1 trillion euros in the middle of 2007 to more than 3 trillion at its peak, now about 2.4 trillion. In essence, the ECB is to a large extent financing both the Eurozone financial system and several Eurozone governments. The situation is much the same in the UK and the US, with the balance sheet of the US Federal Reserve having grown even faster than that of the ECB in the current crisis, from about $0.9 trillion in the middle of 2007 to about $3.6 trillion US dollars at present. Unwinding all of this without causing major economic shockwaves at some point in the future will be an unprecedented and highly complicated task. 
In addition to the cost borne by creditors facing haircuts or capital controls, turbulent flows of capital across borders can induce great hardship in other ways. Collapsing currencies lead to a fall in the standard of living for households and adversely affect trade. The adjustment costs can be very high, both from an economic and social viewpoint. Dramatic austerity measures implemented by governments frantically trying to reduce the need for government borrowing have various obvious adverse effects. This includes direct effects, public service that is no longer offered, public servants that find themselves unemployed, or households that see their tax bill increase, reducing their purchasing power. Cutbacks in vital services such as healthcare can turn a financial crisis into a humanitarian crisis with deteriorating health, rising suicide rates, and various social problems. Indirect effects of austerity include the contractionary effect that government austerity implies for an economy that is in most cases already coping with falling private sector demand, both for consumption and investment. Now, historical examples of how global financial institutions handle financial stress make it clear that trade in financial services is not free from nationalistic considerations. Some of the thorniest disputes to arise from the current financial crises involve troubled financial institutions with substantial overseas assets and liabilities. To properly intervene when such an institution is in dire straits may call for an effort by many governments and raise difficult questions on the distribution of cost or risk and benefits across countries of the actions taken. Addressing deficiencies in this regard has been one of the most pressing items on the agenda for European regulators and policymakers since the onset of the current crises. Indeed, many see the only way to properly solve such issues being a banking union with unified banking supervision, common deposit insurance, and in effect, the resources of all participating governments backing up the banking systems. Such cross-border complications were an issue in Ireland, where the ultimate beneficiaries of the Irish government guarantee of 2008 were to a large extent foreign, but the cost fell mainly on Irish taxpayers. Likewise, the funds that the US government used to prop up AIG benefited greatly various non-US entities. After the collapse of Lehman Brothers, many claimed that in the last days of operation, the investment bank had systematically diverted assets to the US from subsidiaries in Europe. In Cyprus, the fate of foreign depositors and what kind of haircut they would experience compared to local Cypriots was a major issue. The acrimonious ISAFE debate between Iceland on the one hand and Britain and the Netherlands on the other revolved around how these countries would shoulder the cost of bailing out Dutch and British depositors in a collapsed Icelandic bank. The list goes on and on. It seems far from clear from both a theoretical and empirical perspective whether the benefits of freeing up trade in financial services always outweigh the costs particularly when long enough time horizons are considered. Because of the infrequency of tail events, the bad states of the world may have been insufficiently accounted for historically when considering the societal benefits of cross-border trades in financial services. That may of course change when a tail event occurs, which is ex exactly what the world is now experiencing. The challenge may be to try to design an international financial system that allows competition and long-term investments across borders, but at the same time stop local shocks from spreading across borders and preventing excessive turbulence created by rapid movement of funds across borders. Such a system would still allow most of the benefits of the flow of capital and financial services across borders but without most of the downsides to such flow that have played a large role in the current crisis. Politics and regulation both play a large role in shaping the development of the financial sector. The story is, however, very complicated and differs from one country to another. 
In the US, the rollback of constraints on the financial sector, dating back to the Great Depression in the 1990s, was a crucial ingredient in setting the stage for the crisis. The earlier gradual abolishment of the various constraints on cross-border capital flows that was typical in the Bretton Woods era also played a significant role. This allowed the creation of truly global financial institutions with balance sheets that dwarfed those of most nation states. It also resulted in a global financial system that was highly interlinked with shockwaves traveling instantaneously across borders. Deregulation has also led to the rise of ever more, ever more complicated financial institutions, offering a dizzying array of products in global markets. With the financial supermarkets come possible economies of scale and scope through synergies or other means, but also increased complexity, opaqueness, and the attendant risks of value-destroying and rent-seeking behavior. Other consequences of having such supermarkets may include lo loss of stability if financial supermarkets are more likely to fail with systemic consequences than more narrow institutions. For example, the consequences of mixing utility banking with riskier activities such as some aspects of investment bank. In addition, such institutions are hard to regulate due to the complexity of their operations and balance sheets. Arguments for curtailing the size or complexity of individual financial institutions also include the potential, uh, potential for abuse of market power, less competition, prevention of effective monitoring by shareholders or regulators through excessive complexity, abuse of access to information, abuse of political power, and abuse of pu public subsidies. Monitoring of managers of large integrated firms becomes increasingly difficult for independent directors, investors, and financial analysts because such organizations provide more degrees of freedom for managers to conceal their errors, incompetence, and even malfeasance. Large commercial banks currently receive a subsidy in the form of access to public money and public guarantees, implicit if not explicit. The coveted too big to fail status may not provide any explicit gov government guarantee, but the implicit guarantee that comes with it in the eyes of market participants gives such institutions a tremendous advantage over their smaller ri rivals when raising funds. Estimates of this, the value of this subsidy vary greatly. One study by Baker and Mark Arthur in 2009 put the value at between 6.3 and 34 billion US dollars per year for 18 uh, large US banks. The higher figure of the study was the equivalent of almost half of the bank's annual profit. Other studies have returned even higher estimates, up to about 120 basis points off the cost of financing, worth more than 100 billion US dollars per year for large US banks. These subsidies are abused by integrated firms to take large risks in trading, investment banking, and various forms of gambling because of the asymmetric distribution of risk. It is, not, it is expected that the public exchequer will bear the burden of losses, but not enjoy the upside potential. For most other retail industries, one would expect market forces to determine correctly what kind of bundling is appropriate. That happens without much regulatory input and, of course, without implicit government subsidies favoring one setup over another. In general, economic theory does not encourage us to worry over the relative size of various industries or economic sectors. Market forces should normally be able to efficiently channel resources into and out of various industries until their size reaches the level where various marginal conditions are in equilibrium. There are exceptions to this where the economic rationale for curtailing the size of an industry is clear. Fisheries are a case in point where the tragedy of the commons calls for limiting the resources spent on harvesting. But until recently, few arguments have been advanced to, cur to curtail the size or growth of the financial sector. On the contrary, political leaders in many countries have actively advocated policies to help the sector recover from its recent dif difficulties and resume growth 
often by pumping public funds or providing guarantees backed by such funds. Growth of the financial sector has been assumed to benefit the economy. This was not surprising since the sector generated, at least on paper, massive profits, paid high wages, and as a consequence, made a significant contribution to public finances. In essence, the question here is what makes finance so special that justifies regulating and supervising this industry far more than most others? Much has been written on what justifies calls for government regulation in general. The most common economic rationale is asymmetric information among market participants that can lead to market imperfections or failure. This is certainly a factor in financial markets. If the financial sector indeed produces added value for the economy as a whole, one need not worry too much about excessive growth in this sector because there could be no such thing. The current, current financial crisis has, however, led many to question whether the value added by the financial sector to the economy can be measured by the total compensation and profits generated by the industry. Some have pointed out that the profits that the sector generates can to a large extent depend on the pricing of financial assets. A rise in the price of such assets may not correspond to any increase in the value of the real assets and capacity to produce that financial assets must always in the end be based on. Others have pointed out that many of the trades that generate fees for the financial sector are inherently zero-sum, generating no added value for society as a whole. An example of this is when the asset management industry has a high turnover, rationalized by the endless quest to generate excess returns. Such active portfolio management can be very costly due to fees linked to turnover and return and generate a high income for the industry. This can, however, never alter the iron law that not all can beat the market all at the same time, although some can do it some of the time. For most investors or the average investor, it would be better to rely on passive asset management that is far less expensive and thus generates considerably less income for the financial industry. Arguments for the efficiency of democratic polities control of financial services industry are based on the assumption that through a properly functioning democratic and electoral process, government can be expected to reflect what Rousseau termed the general will and thus promote the welfare of society. The counter-argument has to do with the interference of money in the electoral and political process. Large concentrations of financial co capital in the hands of the financial services industry can and does exert undue influence on political institutions to the extent that the ability of these institutions to express and promote the general will of society becomes questionable. The difficulties of legislating and implementing the Dodd-Frank Act in the US is a recent example of this problem. Similar stories have played out in other countries where efforts to curb the excesses of the financial system by legislation and tighter regulation have met with fierce lobbying by the industry. In many cases, the end result has been significantly watered down from the original proposals after having gone through a legislative process where the financial industry still has a significant say. The development of the Basel III standard is another example. In that case, the financial industry managed to thwart efforts at significantly raising equity requirements for banks. This happened despite the tremendous cost that taxpayers in many countries have had to shoulder when banks with wafer-thin equity buffers got into trouble in the current crisis. The question of effective regulation in an arena where large rents are earned is in general a difficult one. Regulatory capture of one form or another seems to be endemic to the financial industry. There is also a question of how difficult a task regulation becomes the more complicated the financial system gets. This suggests that the res resolution to defining the appropriate constraints for the financial sector should perhaps be structural, that is, limiting the advent of more and more complexity and opaqueness 
rather than having an equally complex, opaque, and hard to understand regulatory code. Perhaps simplicity comes at a cost, but the alternatives costs ought also to be evaluated. There isn't really any alternative to trying to regulate the financial services industry as well as possible, except of course the alternative of letting the industry self-regulate. Now, all developed countries need a well-functioning financial market. This will always be costly to operate. We should, however, not accept any level of cost. The financial system, like other parts of the economy, should serve society, its customers, employees, and owners, and then make a fair contribution to paying for public services. It should generate far more benefits than costs. One of the most important challenges for the world economy moving forward will be to build a framework that ensures that. It will call for a rethinking of many of the academic foundations of global finance. Perhaps the motto of that project should be, small is beautiful. Thank you. <laughs>